Hello. Hello. Yes, so Silver's Traders Lounge is delighted to host one of our guest speakers tonight, um, Fred Scott. Welcome to this podcast. And we'd like to start by you introducing yourself and telling us about your trading history as a hedge fund manager um, in a nutshell. Yeah, I've been trading since I was in high school. So I guess that makes it about 10 years now, 12 years actually. And I started managing my own money for a while and just trying to get a hang of the markets, see how things work. And um, after two or three years, people started taking notice and what I was doing, since I was talking to people about trading and about the markets and stocks, um, they started asking me more questions about it. And little by little, um, friends started giving me their money and, and I started managing a bigger pool of money, which was just friends and family members. And it wasn't anything formal at that moment. And then after a while, uh, I met somebody who was starting a hedge fund and they asked me if I wanted to come in with them. So I said, um, sure. And I was going to school at the moment. So I figured I could go to school and do the hedge fund thing on the side. And we decided to start a fund that was focused on U.S. stocks only. Um, reasons being because we know how the U.S. market is and we know Uh-huh. It's more complicated for a fundamental trader to get a hang of that if you're not there. And um, so we said, well, let's focus on the stocks here. And we started um, adding clients little by little. Um, my partner was the one that was mostly in charge of that. I was mostly in charge of finding the companies and the ideas that we were going to invest in. And he was kind of like the face of the, of the, of the fund. And he would go out there and, and, and meet people and raise money for us. After two, two years of doing this, we decided to close it because we figured out that a fund that gets too big becomes a little too um, reliant on the market as a whole the correlation kind of picks up. So you start getting the same returns that everyone else gets. Of course, there are funds that defy this logic. And you know, there's, you hear about them all the time, this guy that made 30% or 40% last year, things like that. What people don't really know is that those years are, let's say two or three out of 10. And for the most part, those funds underperform the market as a whole. Uh, if you take expenses out, and all of that, it's really not worth it to my, at least I thought it wasn't worth it to the people that I wanted to manage the money for. And I've always been of the mind of like, well, I want you guys to make as much money as possible. And I want to take the fees that are necessary to continue, but I didn't want to rip people off. I don't want to do the, the traditional two and 20 model of the mm -hmm. Wall Street hedge fund, which is, you know, 2% of of uh, managing fees and 20% of profits. I, I thought that that was outrageous. And um, I mean, most people would do much better just buying a, a, an index fund. But when we, were, when we started, we said, hey, let's keep it under a certain amount of money. And that way we can really outperform. And we can have a, a certain type of contract with our partners to let them know that this is our investment style. And we're not going to we're not gonna get any bigger because it's gonna influence their returns. And so we committed ourselves to keeping the fund under a certain amount of money in order to maximize the profits we can make. And I've been doing that for about five years, seven years, five to seven years, I can't remember to be honest. And yeah, that's it for now. Okay, I'd be interested to know what got you started. Like you said you started way back in high school. How did you know that you were set for that kind of career path. Did you have any people that went before you that directed you into finance 
or you just did it out of curiosity? Um, I don't know anybody in finance. At least at that moment, I didn't know anybody in finance. And I didn't know anything about finance myself. The reason why I got interested in it was because of a book. It was really that simple. I was reading a book about the history of the dollar. And okay. I don't, for some reason, oh, oh I remember. I was, play, I was a soccer player and I got hurt. I injured my ankle and I couldn't really walk for like three months. And that's when I picked up reading. And uh, I went to the library and I picked out this book that just looked interesting. And it was called the, the, the History of the Dollar. And I found it interesting because nobody really talks about that. Everyone talks about money, but nobody says where it came from. Nobody says what it really is. So I wanted to know that. Once I started reading this book, I started realizing, wow, this is pretty complex. And in the book, it described, um, I, I can't remember the author, but it described everything about the dollar, where it came from, the gold standard, the Federal Reserve, how everything worked and money managers a little bit. It kind of touched up on that and the stock market as a whole. So from there, I got interested in the flow of money. And I, but my primary, my biggest interest was um, how market crashes happen. That's really what I got interested in. So when, when I was in high school, I started reading up on market crashes, you know, the 1987, the yeah. Great Depression, 23, and you know, all that stuff. And in 2008, since um, we were barely coming out of that, I wanted to know why that happened. Most people have their own theories, but nobody has one unifying theory of it. So I wanted to understand why, why, market cra why markets crash and why is it that it happens every seven years on average or whatever it is. And um, because of that, I needed to understand how markets work. And I got interested in stocks because um, I was always fascinated by companies. I always wanted to start my own. So I wanted to learn how a company works from the inside. And I figured that the best way to learn how a company works is by learning how their books work, how learning fundamental analysis per, per se. And um, once you figure out everything from the bottom up, that's my style investing. Um, you kind of figure out where you want to take your company, what you can do with it. And that kind of got me into the whole um, fund managing thing. But it wasn't my intent. It was kind of by accident. Okay. And I was, I was really just focused on learning. I, that was really my, my point. And I was okay using my own money because it's my own money. If I lost everything, it didn't matter. But when I started managing other people's money, I started taking it more seriously because, you know, you don't want to lose other people any money. <laughs> okay. So did you get the confidence to, like, trade other people's money after you traded your own personal money? And how was that, like, how long did it take you to know that you, you're now good enough to be able to manage your client's money? Well, you started with your friends and family and like you said, but at what point did you, did you say, yes, now I'm ready to go ahead and manage people's um, money? I kind of just saw it like a, a service, to be honest. That's the way I see my money management. Like we are supposed to serve our customers and provide as much of a um, positive result as we can, putting our needs second or third. That's the way I saw it. And I we always envisioned the investment community to be like this. Everyone always thinks that Wall Street is this place full of greedy people. And in mm -hmm. some ways it is. But I've, I always, I've met other people who are not like that. And they have really their, their clients' interests in mind. And they, they don't go out and buy boats and, and airplanes. You know, they... they they like to make as much money for the clients and that brings them happiness. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help my friends in the beginning for, because, you know, we all come from humble beginnings and we have a small check to, to do whatever we have to do with it, pay our bills or whatever. So I wanted to help them have a little extra. And if I had this somewhat talent um, to help them, then I said, why not? I didn't know I was good enough. 
since you asked if I knew I was good enough, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was more like people told me, "Hey, you've been doing this for a while. Why don't you take a shot?" They kind of took a chance on me. If anything, they were um, very supportive, and 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 honestly, I don't know if I would have done the same for someone else, but they did it for me, and I'm forever grateful. Which is why I still manage their money to this day, and that's why. I decided to say, hey, um, if I can do this for my friends, I want to help other people. And that was my, basically my rationaliz rationalization about starting a management fund because I always wanted to help other people. And not just rich people, but people who, who just want to have a little extra, maybe retire a little more comfortably. That's okay. what I really wanted. It wasn't really about anything else other than serving my clients. Okay, so like you're still with the same um, managing partner that you that who initially introduced you into hedge fund business, or you went ahead and started your own hedge fund? Yeah, we're still the same. Yeah, we're still the, um, doing it together. He is the technical analyst. Okay. And okay. we have another guy who's who's uh, we acquired him a little later. He is he does currency. So we have a guy who does currency, a guy who does technical analysis, and me who does fundamental analysis. But okay, at the end of the day, I think what sets our fund apart is that all of us three sit together and we bounce ideas off each other and all of our different backgrounds kind of bring out what the next idea is going to be. Okay, that's good to know. So on average, your company size is a minimum of three, but you have the basic pillars of fundamental, technical, and the basic pillars of trading in your fund that's a good thing yeah, so we use a lot of we use a lot of technology too like you know we get a lot of analyst reports and stuff like that so we don't really need to hire other people because all this information is out there all you have to do is access it so yeah. we want we want to keep costs as slow as possible so we don't like to employ as many people because that's going to cut into everyone's return Okay, so you've been doing this for 10 years now, Fred. What's your typical day like? Like, how does your work schedule look like? Um, especially during the earning season when sometimes it can get a little bit busy. How does your day yeah. look like? I, well, I usually start around 4 a.m. my time. Uh, I live in California, so the East Coast, it's already 7. And... I read whatever happened the night before. Sometimes deals get announced the night before. So I get up and I read stuff, the news reports, whatever's in my inbox, analyst reports. And I kind of go from there to the gym. And after that, I go to the office and we talk about what's happening that day. We try not to focus on what happened in the past because we're the firm belief that I mean, if you bought a stock at $10 and it goes to eight and you wake up and it's at seven, you shouldn't worry about you buying it at 10. You should worry about why it's at mm -hmm. So we just kind of like look at, we try to keep our, our outlook in the, in, the, in the future. And we talk about our ideas. Usually my partners have something to say. Uh, they, they do their own research. I do my own research. And then we come together and try to poke holes through whatever we come up with. If I come up with an idea of this is what we do in the morning every, every day usually, we sit down, we, we have tea, coffee, whatever it is, and then we bounce the idea that we have that day. Let's say I think about uh, investing in an industrial company. They might come up with other, with why not investing in an you know, industrial company. So um, it's kind of fun because it really challenges you to prove why your idea is, is worth it why should we put money in it? And they're really um, blunt about their, their um, research and because the, you know, they know what they're talking about. They're confident about what they're saying. So they can actually make it pretty difficult for me sometimes. And I make it difficult for them too. Because, you know, sometimes, sometimes they come up with something that I'm like, I don't know about that. But you know, like, that's how we work. And I like that because it's, it's, it's an open, floor for anybody to say anything and it sometimes 
outrageous things come out, but those have been very good ideas for the most part. And we sometimes start from a very small pieces and develop it into something bigger. So that's in the morning. And then in the afternoon, we kind of just each go our own way. Um, we don't like to trade in the morning because I see that a lot of mistakes are made in short term in the market. And a lot of, like you say, during earnings season, a lot of um, earnings come out. And there's no way analysts, even in Wall Street, can read all those reports. It's thousands of companies. There's no way they know what's going on with each company. So a lot of, there's a lot of stock price dislocation going on. And sometimes you see companies go down for no reason. No reason at all. Like the other day, for example, there was a report on a housing company and that was positive. And for some reason, Home Depot, which is a, you know, a supplier for them, it went down. So we said, why would Home Depot go down? Instead, it should be going up. So those are the kind of opportunities we try to take. So we kind of wait for the market to, to make mistakes. And then we come in and we take the stocks that we've been looking at. Okay. You raise... we, do that, we do that in the afternoon before the close. Yeah, you raise a very good point. There's a guy, a trader who said that stupid money trades uh, during the market open because everyone is chasing and trying to make up for the previous day's um, mistakes or a loss and trying to cover up for yeah, yeah, I can see that. that kind of trading. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is that you usually know what, I mean, it's been happening maybe the last two or three years. Whenever mm -hmm. you see the futures, you see the futures open and you already, you already know kind of what's going to happen at least in the first two hours just by looking at the futures market. So you're like, okay, well, if stocks are up or if or just by looking at Europe. If you look at the Europe market and you look at how they're doing, our market tracks that pretty closely. I don't know why that's been happening, maybe because we have this so-called synchronized recovery going on. But every time the Europe market moves up, our market usually comes up in the morning. And if Europe goes down, our market is down in the morning. So that's the kind of opportunity I like to pounce on because I mean, what does Europe really have to do with Target? You know, like Target doesn't have any business in Europe. So if, if I see that stock go down, yeah. there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with the company. There's just something wrong with the stock. And that's what, I, that's what we like to go for. Okay. So you said that you're a fundamental analyst. That's your niche. That's where your specialty is. How, how do you define your risk? How would you say, how would you like, say is your ideal risk reward ratio allocation and how do you communicate that to your clients especially with regard to their expected returns um well i think my contract is very clear with them meaning they shouldn't expect any returns and that might sound outrageous to some people they might say well this guy's crazy but no like if you're investing money, you know that your, your risk is to lose it. So um, every time I speak to my clients, I let, I let them know that ahead of time. I'm like, hey, I'm not, you know, some kind of guru or some kind of like, you know, let them, like I can't, guarantee, I can't guarantee you 10% every year. There's no way. I mean, I would be lying to you. So I'd rather just tell them the truth and say, hey, there's going to be some volatility. And we might have some years that we're going to outperform by a huge margin. And then there's going to be other years that we're just going to barely trail the market or do the same as the market. But so far, we haven't had a down year. But um, you never know the future. So I usually base my fundamental analysis on the way that... Um, a company does its business from the bottom. And I mean all the way in the bottom. For example, if we're looking at a, a retailer, which is the easiest example I can come up with, a retailer, they sell clothes or whatever it is. And I like to actually go there and visit it and see, okay, well, do I like the experience? Is it even like, why do people come here? And I, I ask random people, I'm like, hey, do you like this store? Do you come here often? And you know, most people are willing to answer. 
So they're like, yeah, I come here often. Or they say, oh, no, I'm just here around. So I just stop in. You know, whatever reasons they may have. I like to take those reviews pretty seriously because these are people who are actually spending their money there. Then I, uh, if I think that the store is being ran nicely and, and everyone's happy and the customers are going to it, then I'll probably, you know, I even talk to the people who work there, the cashiers, whatever it is. I'm like, hey, do you like working here? Are you happy? You know, some of them say yes, some of them say no. And you got to take that with a grain of salt because it depends on the person. But for the most part, they're pretty honest. And from there, I, I like to, you know, look into the financials and see, okay, well, this store is selling pretty nicely. And, and if I like what I see in the numbers, then uh, if I can get a, me a meeting with management, which is somewhat hard, but not really. If I can get a meeting, a, me a meeting with management, I usually have a, I usually get a meeting with them, talk to them a little bit. They don't tell you anything you probably would wouldn't find in public because they're really careful these days with the whole inside insider selling insider yes. selling thing. Yes. So, so they 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 like to keep the cards close to their chest, and you know they. But sometimes they let they let some valuable information come out, not related to trading, but related to the business related to the industry and if i'm looking at store a and i might not like what i saw but the management gave me a good outlook in the industry maybe i might find a better store than store a so that's where i, I start with and um since we take we don't like to take concentrated bets like some people who put like 40 or 50 percent of their holdings in one thing and hope that that works out. I, I don't like to really rely on hope. Um, what we like to do is we were very, very diversified. Like I said, we have a currency guy, a, a technical analyst. So they're doing their thing with a percentage that they have to manage. And then I'm doing mine with the percentage I had to manage. But we all diversify within each one of our pools of money. So. The currency guy, he's diversified his way. The technical analyst is diversified his way. And then I'm diversified among different sectors and industries. So at the end of the day, if I have a higher conviction in one thing or another, I may make the trade a little bigger. For example, um, last year, I found this pharmaceutical company that I knew was going to be big. So because I've been doing a lot of work on it, I even talked to few of the doctors that were in, in the trials and I heard very good things and there was really no competition absolutely none they were the only ones with that drug so I said I mean if it fails it won't go badly because they're the only ones doing this and if it comes through who knows how much we can make we can even make 80 90 percent so that's exactly what happened we invested in it for a year nothing happened for a year it was just kind of sitting there. And I kept in touch with, 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 with the doctors. I, I was looking at the trials and everything was fine. Then a year and maybe two months later, the trial happened. The FDA said that they were going to approve it. And boom, the stock shot up like 75% in a day. Th wow. that, was a concentrate, that was a concentrated bet because I've been adding to this position over a year's time. Like, I don't like to put my position all at once. Okay. I, I like, depending on my conviction, I like to either ease into it or buy on weakness. I don't like to buy stocks that go up. I know a lot of technical analysts are like, what? I only buy stocks that go up. But no, no, no. At least the way that I see it, um, I don't want to chase. So if I see that a stock is coming in and there's really nothing wrong with the company itself, I like to buy on weakness. And, okay. and I don't mind taking my time with something. Like I said, that, was, that took 14 months to play out. So that was, that's something that my clients know and they're aware. So maybe during the year that they were waiting for that, maybe they didn't get the 30 or 40% that they're used to getting. But the next year, they got 90% returns, you know? So nobody's really complaining. Yeah, <laughs> it balances off, especially when they have no zero expectations. Yeah, I think one of our biggest, um, 
I guess, concerns is to keep people informed and tell them, tell them the truth. Tell them, hey, we like this company. We're going to take a pretty big position in it. It might throw the, off the portfolio a little bit, but we will keep a close eye on it. And like um, you were asking about risk management, I like to give myself some breathing room. So if, uh, for example, in that pharmaceutical company I was talking about before, um, I think we started putting it in position when the stock was around $23 or so. Then it went down to like $16. So it's a pretty big drop. And some people would have been nervous. I was a little nervous, but at the same time, it wasn't because I knew that my research was sound. And I am a firm believer that if you do the right work, the right research, if the stock doesn't reflect your research, it's just a matter of time before it does. Unless you miss something. But if you are really good at researching and you really took your, your time to, to try to prove yourself wrong, which is what I mostly spend my time doing, try to prove <laughs> <laughs> if you try to prove yourself wrong and you, you couldn't do it, you couldn't knock your idea down, then I think if the stock goes from 23 to 16, you should be fine. And we kept adding to our position and every dollar it would go down. And some people asked me, well, when would you let it go? When would you admit you're wrong? Because I mean, it's 14 months. For some people, that's an eternity. So, um, so I would say, well, when, if, the stock, if the stock keeps dropping, I'm going to keep buying it. And then they're like, why? And I'm like, because the company hasn't said anything. It's been completely silent for nine months. Why is the, why is the price dropping? I have no idea. But the company hasn't said anything. So I can't trade on nothing. And maybe some, you know, maybe I guess that's just the good thing of technical analysis is that you can just look at a chart and it doesn't even matter what the company is doing. Just as long as the chart says what it says, then you go with that. But in fundamental analysis, you have to hear from the company. If you don't, you're trading blindly and you have no idea what you're doing, at least I think. And um, I said, well, if the company says something like, hey, we can't, we can't do this, we're gonna just cut the, the, the study or we're gonna cut the trial, that's when I would exit. But until the company says something, I'm gonna stay in. So yes. I guess, that in that kind of trade, that's how I manage my risk. I wait for the company to say something. Um, yes, that's especially because fundamental analysis is based on news, and you determine most of your decisions are based on the news that you receive, say, from a company or a political situation or an economic review, that sort of thing. Is it? Yeah. Well, since I'm since since I'm more focus on companies less than the macro stuff then yeah like you said it's about news and in this case of this example that i'm giving it's all about the news and even though they reported you know four quarters they didn't say anything about negative about the drug and they still had the money to to bring it into 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 um, the market so they weren't burning through the cash like most of pharmaceutical companies do that would have made me nervous, but I didn't see that. So I was like, hey, these guys are being responsible with their, with their cash. They didn't even have to raise money. So I was pretty confident about it. I'm pretty sure if they knew that it wasn't going to play out, they probably would have raised money or they probably would have just dropped it. I mean, I've seen that happen before. So it's kind of experience too. It has something to do with it, I think. And... Um, it also depends on the conviction you have on the trade. That was a very high conviction trade. I was willing to lose maybe even 50% of what I put in because I knew that it was going to play out the way that I wanted it to. It was just a matter of time. But if I had a lower conviction, like per se, I like this company because of a certain catalyst and then maybe the catalyst didn't turn out, I would exit the trade as soon as I decide to drop a dollar. Like I, I keep a very tight stop on, on, on trades that I don't have a hundred percent conviction on. So I hear, yeah. okay. I hear that when it comes to stocks, um, money, money is taken from the impatient investor to the patient investor. So you raise a very good point about timing and waiting until you find your, you know, your guts, 
I don't know, you don't rely on hope, but your moment to exit. Well, you have to know like the reasons why you're buying it in the first place. And if you don't know them, then there's no reason why you should buy it. And I, I believe that um, if you have good reasons for buying that stock or selling it, because we do a lot of short sales too, um, we wait for those reasons to play out. And if they don't play out, you exit that second. You don't, you don't hope for things to change. You just exit. Your strategy didn't work. You move on. Yes. And we, we try not to get attached to those things. Okay. Talk to me about compliance and regulation in the hedge fund business in the United States. Um, well, it's, I guess it's gotten a lot tougher. Not too much tougher, but it has. Um, the good thing, though, is that a lot of technology has made it easier for the hedge fund community to do whatever they had to do and not have to overcharge their customers. So, uh, because all the, all the costs we incur are passed on to our clients because, you know, we don't make money if they don't make money. So, um, the good thing about the, the new changes that have been happening is that it has made it a little more secure for investors, meaning, if you want to invest in a hedge fund now, it's a lot safer than back in the 80s. In the 80s, you were just really giving your money to a black box. You had no idea what was going to happen. But now, uh, there's oversight. You have to get audited. You have to make sure that you don't post any suspicious trades. Like if a, like if a stock drops, like if you sell all your stock or something and then the next day the company comes out with the bad news, you'll probably be investigated. Uh, that kind of thing has happened to even big time fund managers. And uh, I think people have learned a lesson when it comes to insider trading. But, you know, still, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm pretty sure it still happens somewhere. I'm just not sure where. And I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think anybody can prove it, to be honest. But I... Sometimes you see trades, you see them on, the, you know, you see block trades happen and you're like, why is this person buying so much of that stock? And then the next week, something big happens. So it makes you just wonder, like, somebody knew something. Yes, but, yes. Yeah, but there's no way you can prove that. Nobody can. Not even the SEC can. So, um, but regulatory-wise, I think, honestly, I am an advocate for the, for the customer. So, Whatever makes it safer for them is good with me. I'm not going to be one of those people that's like, less regulation is better. No, no, no. I don't, I don't believe that. I think that we need regulation because we're managing people's money, people's savings, so people's uh, hopes, really. A lot of people put their hope in us. So why should we take advantage of something like that? And if the regulatory environment is going to make it safer for them, and it's going to make it easier for us because it, it, at the end of the day, it does get easier. We don't have to um, make all these tough calls. And, 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 you know, in the 80s, I can have your money today and then call you tomorrow and say, I'm sorry, you lost everything. And there would be nothing you can do. Now, you can't really do that. There's, there's a whole process. You have to de declare yourself bankrupt, go to court, and then the court has to, you know, take as much money as they can from the fund and, and disperse it amongst its investors. But back in the day, it wasn't like that. And then um, now you see more, prof I guess you would call them professionals doing this. Back in the day, it wasn't really professionals, but now it's, it's more like guys that went to Harvard, you know, really smart guys. And, and these guys are coming up with very innovative ways of managing money. You know, systems trading is something that I'd be interested in. But they, they've been coming with all these fancy ways of trading that have been working. But I, I just, I'm waiting to see how those systems would do in a down market. We haven't had one in well, almost 10 years. So I would like to see how all of that would do in a down market. But regulatory wise, I think it has made it definitely safer for the consumer, for the investor. Uh, it has made it safer for the hedge fund too because that way we're less bound to make stupid bets. And um, 
if you know a lot of people i don't know if they remember long long term capital management that was a huge hedge fund that just went under and in the 90s and there were you know nobel winners and and uh all these really smart guys uh ex fed chair was in it and everyone said give them their money they're geniuses give it to them and they lost everything in just less than three years so what happened was it fraud was it mismanagement it's it just, it just bad trading that's all it was okay and there was no accountability in terms of um, regulation no credibility nothing they were bailed out by the federal reserve okay because it was there was such a big fund and everyone was investing so much money into it that if they collapsed they the fed believed that it would bring the whole system with it okay i see that okay you talk about um technology and trading systems and with the modern um technology and the uprise of coding languages algorithms um artificial intelligence machine learning all that does your hedge fund make use of any any of this and um in terms of how you do your operations does does your hedge fund has a, have a space for this new technology um i think there is space definitely for it we use a lot of uh research tools mostly and all of a lot of it is prop, uh, you know property of the, the the seller so i don't really know how it works inside but um regarding to artificial intelligence and stuff like that i think it's still pretty young um but i've seen funds that are exclusively allocating a portion of their money to uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and stuff like that and yes. i think that's uh, i think that's pretty pretty cool in my point of view but for us um I, we're not that big to put that much money into something that's just basically a gamble but um i think that there is a space definitely and i think in the future it will become kind of part of any everyone's portfolio uh, in the sense of like now you you have your traditional 60% stocks 40% bonds or whatever it is but i believe that in the future you're going to have a portion of your money in some kind of smart beta strategy uh in, those strategies are you know all computer models so um it's be, it's going to make it more difficult for hedge fund managers in the future to, for sure because why should they pay us uh 220 when they can pay this thing 0.20 or 0.15% you know which is significantly less so um ETFs and smart beta ETFs and all that kind of stuff is going to make fund managers either they're going to they're going to they kind of kind of weed out the ones that don't work and the ones that are really good they're going to get really big that's what i think is going to happen because oh, okay. you have you can have people like you know Ray Dalio or something they manage 170 billion or whatever it is you those people are not going to go anywhere but the little ones that are like coming up and maybe they're not so good or maybe nobody has heard of them they're going to have a tougher time because all these smart beta strategies are going to just be cheaper so it's going to bring costs way lower commissions you're starting to see that go down too i mean some some brokerage houses are giving trades for free now so i think um i think the same thing is going to happen to the to the hedge fund industry in in the future if we don't have anything special to offer if your fund has something that's outside of the norm and you actually are innovating and you're using technology in any creative ways then yeah you will get money some way but if you're just a regular traditional hedge fund i just don't see the use for you and i also I think that, mm-hmm. i do think that there is a place for technology in in everyone's everyone's lives yes because i think the technology will also make the data analysis more faster easier accessible to most people so like you're saying most of 
your kind of business entities will be out of business unless they, they're willing to innovate. Yeah, that's what we, we uh, personally use it more for, for data analysis. That's our focus because I feel like that big data has allowed fundamental analysis to be a little more accurate even because you have data points to base your, your analysis off of. A technical analysis relies on data. The more data you have as a technical analyst, the better your chart will look, the, better, the more accurate it will be. And yeah. um, so it works for everyone, really. So we do invest a lot into that, and it's worked out. I, I'm, I'm grateful for it. It's part of like what goes into your research and development um, yeah, cost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So have you ever in your in your trading career have you changed brokers at some point and if yes why In the beginning when I was managing my own money I tried almost all of them <laughs> um, I just wanted to see like the, the the how it worked so I was kind of just jumped having a bunch of little tiny accounts all over the place mm -hmm. and um uh, some accounts were handled better than others. So I started uh, drifting towards, you know, the better service. But when I started my fund, um, we figured out this clearinghouse. It's called the IEX. And they, they're an exchange, I guess. They go direct, you know, they clear your trades and you don't have to go through a broker. But, well, you do if you want to, but you don't have to. But um, this, this, this exchange is, I believe, is um, it's amazing because I found it through a book again. Um, because these guys were tired of the whole high frequency traders and they were, tra they were, tar they were tired of being uh, front run for every trade. Because if you're trading in big blocks, it doesn't matter if you're a small trader or a small investor. It really doesn't matter. But if, if you're trading more money, that's when you start to see it. Because if a stock price moves by two pennies, it makes a big difference. So um, these guys were seeing that if the stock price was at 100, by the time they clicked on it, it was at 102. Or yeah, 102 and two pennies. So they would be like, why? Why did it just move? I just barely clicked on it. You can't even see it with your eyes. So these high frequency traders were just front running you. And, and, and getting your trade and, 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 and bidding it up. And, you know, that's okay. Some people say that that provides liquidity and sometimes it does, but um, it makes it harder for us because we're trying to get the, the best price and we don't want to basically um, give up anything because we're competitive like that. So when we see two pennies leave that we had no control over, we're like, hey, what happened to that? And then um, these guys, from IEX, they, they started their own exchange and they made it basically almost impossible for high frequency traders to front run you because everyone is trading at the same speed. And um, that is what I liked about them. So the price that you get through them, that's the price you're going to get. And that's what I like. Um, not to put the other exchanges down, but, okay. but bigger, bigger firms have better pricing power than smaller firms like us. So if we go through through uh, the NASDAQ or the NYC. Or NYC. Is, yeah, they're, they're gonna make it, they're gonna give priority to JP Morgan. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just, and I don't, I don't blame them for it. That's, that's how they make it. <laughs> it's how business works. Yeah. It's, it's that I, I like this exchange because they don't, they don't do that. So, um, Brokerage wise, I think the industry is a lot better though, because uh, like I said, uh, commissions have been going down and uh, I think in the future trading might even be free. I mean, you have stuff like Robinhood, that's completely free. And uh, yeah, you can't short sell, you can do a lot of things, but I think in the future later on, 10 years from now, it might just go to zero. I mean, you're seeing firms like Fidelity, Vanguard, huge, huge investment houses, bring their fees all the way to four bucks. I mean, in the 80s, if you wanted to trade something, it was like 30 something dollars. Okay. Now it's, it's four bucks. 
I mean, it's, impre it's impressive. Or if you go like interact with brokers or whatever, that's like pennies for every trade you do if you're an active trader. So these are things that I believe is going to push the industry to just be more efficient and, and cheaper because they're just going to find other ways to make money. And then the, the whole clearing trades business is just going to be like a, like a service that they just do for free. And um, so from the from the brokerage houses that I liked, um, I, I have to say there's not much difference from one and the other. It's just the way that they clear their trades. Sometimes they they break, like let's say I buy a thousand shares of something. Sometimes they might break it up into blocks of of a hundred or blocks of two hundred and sell it through other exchanges. And sometimes that works in our advantage, but sometimes it doesn't. But that's something we had no control over. And um, I like to pay attention to these things. Some people don't, but I do. And um, those other brokerage houses that we only use when we really are just running out of uh, of of places to get, um, you know, um, stocks from. Because sometimes there might be an IPL that that is very small float. Mm -hmm. So if we want to get a, a, an allocation from it, we might have to just go to one of the traders, to one of the brokers we don't like, but that's okay. You know, that that's just a quick trade. And, um, but we usually try to get the best execution in our trades. That's what we try to go for. Okay. How do you deal with noise and uh, especially from social media or even analyst TV news, Bloomberg? how do you manage to stay focused on your analysis um like case in point the recent debate on whether bitcoin is a worthy investment choice for most people how do you how do you cope with such um well i like to listen to everything to be honest i'm not one of those people who just like locks themselves in a cave and ignores everything i think I think there's a place and some validity sorry, in things that, that the news has to say. But again, you have to trust your own judgment after everything, before everything. And you have to say, okay, well, if I'm watching CNBC or reading the newspaper and uh, an analyst is talking and he might say something that I might find interesting, I have to sit here and think critically and say, okay, Am I going to invest in what this guy's saying? Or am I going to invest because I have some kind of a conviction on, on, on my research? So you have to kind of classify what you mean by noise with your actual work. You can't, you can't go out there looking for validation. Meaning if, you, if you're going to buy a stock and you did your, your work, uh, you can't go out there looking for only good news about it or only analysts that, that corroborate your view because it's going to make you very biased. So that's why I like to listen to everything, even the bears as well as the bulls, because that way I can say, okay, well, these guys think that this is not going to turn out that way. Maybe I'm missing something. And then I go back to my work. But it doesn't make the news less important. What is important is what you do with it. And you know you can listen to it, you can read the newspaper, and you can do everything you want. But as long as you don't trade off things you don't understand, you should be fine. And um, and you know a lot of financial news is just entertainment. That's pretty much what it is. It's just you know we're talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> that I, I I think that's just <laughs> for the most part. I mean it's it's a lot of people think it's fun. You know it's like wow this thing just went up five hundred percent in a year. It's crazy. Well, yeah and. Everybody missed it, honestly, because if you tell me that you, you caught it, uh, you're one of the few because everyone missed it. And that's why everyone's so, everyone's so infatuated with Bitcoin because everyone missed it. And everyone's like, how could I have missed that? Well, there's no way you would have known. You don't use Bitcoin. That's my point. So you can't, you can't invest in something that you just don't know. And Yeah, that's and true. If you, missed, if you missed it, you missed it. I mean, I, I, I'm a believer in Bitcoin. I think it has a place in society, but I'm not going to go and buy it 7,000 or whatever it is now just because I believe that 
all of a sudden. I mean, I've never used Bitcoin. I don't even know how I can use it. Like, I can't go to the store and buy anything with it yet. So um, once it becomes more everyday life, kind of like, I think it would have a place. Whether it will be worth 20000 or zero, who knows? But uh, right now, I'd rather just watch. And my personal money, I did put some in Bitcoin, but that's just... I believe entertainment too, because it, it's my money. I'm not putting the funds money in there. And um, uh, I think that I don't, I'm not going to get obsessed with the valuation of Bitcoin because how can you value something that you don't even know what it really is? It's just Bitcoin to me, is like a, it's what it is. It's blockchain, which means it's like a bridge. So if you're investing in a bridge, you can't really value it because you don't know what's going to go through it. So um, all these people who get in CNBC or whatever and they try to value Bitcoin, I just think it's a little silly. But um, <laughs> like I said, it's, it's entertainment and people like it. But if you want to separate that from actual trading, I just think you have to believe in your own research. And if you think that some analyst is saying something that, that you missed, go back to your research and start over. Uh, it doesn't hurt. And your stock is probably not going to move as much. So just go back, look over your research, and if you agree with the analyst, then cool. If you don't, then go with, go with your own research first. Whatever you see after that, go back to your research and check with that. Don't just say, oh my God, the analyst is right. I'm gonna go trade on what he said. No, that's, no, that's really bad. Okay, we're almost coming to the close of this interview. Um, do you have any trading icons that you look up to and if so, why do you admire them? Um, since I told you that I got interested in crises, um, crashes, financial crashes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. my first, first inspiration was Ray Dalio for sure. I mentioned him earlier. Um, he, he, that's what he is. He's an expert on market crashes. And every time that there's a crash anywhere in the world, Japan, they, anywhere, they have him on speed dial. It's impressive. So I, I, I think he's one of the best. And his discipline is almost second to none. Um, I, I don't really know how he trades it's because he's very secretive about like what kind of trades he takes. Mm -hmm. he, wrote a book on, he wrote a book on principles, something. I saw something like that. Yeah, that's his in management style. Okay. And, um, I got, I'm yet to read it though. It's, it looks good. Um, and yeah, he's very secretive about the stuff he does, but he, his research team is outrageous. It's like bigger than the feds. So this guy has more information at his hands than almost anybody. Um, and I think it's impressive that somebody can condense all that information and make it into something. And that's what he does. So that he's one of those people I like, then, you know, there's the legends like, you know, Buffett, uh, um, he, what I like about him is that he sticks to his principles. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. He sticks to what he knows. You know, he's not, he's not seducted by, seduced by Bitcoin. He doesn't care about that. You know, like he doesn't, <laughs> he, 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 he only worries about is Coca-Cola still making Coke? You know, like that's, that's all you get. I, I, that's what I love about this guy. And, um, then you also have, you also have others like, uh, uh, Jim Channels. He is, he's one of my favorite short, uh, short sellers for sure, because he has the guts to actually do it. And short selling, I think it's definitely more complicated than just buying the, op the opposite of buying, how a lot of people think it is. I think short selling is way more complicated than that. I happen to be, I think, better at short selling than low going long. But he is definitely my top influence when it comes to that. And I recommend anybody, anybody to research those three guys especially channels because i think he's more out there and um and he actually talks about his position and why he why he is on them and uh what i like about him the most is that he has the curse to be wrong for years and then at the end of the day he's the ones laughing laughing and smiling into the bank you know like yeah. he can he can be short a company for five years lose billions of dollars and then at the end of the day, he'll be proven right. He did that with Enron. 
and he was he was greatly rewarded for that you know so and you know that was a scam and he was the only one that really saw it at at the time so then you know there, there's people like that that's why i like short sell short selling because i feel like it roots out um inefficiencies and then you have other people i'm not much into technical analysis but i do like this this guy that comes out of cnbc uh, carter worth he's amazing i think I don't know what he does, but he's amazing. What's and, his name uh, again? Carter Is, Worth. Okay. He comes out on CNBC and then random shows. And he also, I think he's in a, in a research house. I'm not sure. But I, I just see him on CNBC. And I think he's one of the best technical analysts I've ever seen. And he, what I like about him is that he uses the same technique that I use, which I don't use any, any, I, I use technical analysis too. And I don't use any, any, um, uh, indicators. I've never really thought it makes sense. A lot of people, <laughs> like to, a, a lot of people like to uh, use all these. I'm offended these because I use uh, one indicator. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, if it works for you, but um, in I just don't think it makes sense to use so many yeah i've seen guys that use like nine or ten i'm like why yeah that's that, outrageous that, it is it's just gonna throw it some indicators some indicators are completely the adverse of one another so how could you use two things that are the opposite well, whatever that's a different mm -hmm. conversation yeah. but yeah he 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 doesn't use any 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 indicators he goes off you know trend analysis basically and he's very good i everything that i see him actually well I say eighty percent of everything he says usually happens. He's really that good, and um, oh. I wish he worked with us. <laughs> and, um, yeah, the, the, those are people I'm, I think I found impressive. But I think my biggest influences are business leaders, people like um, Howard Schultz from Starbucks, or like guys like you know even Tim Cook from Apple, and you know he, uh, Bill Gates and, and Satya Nadella, the new guy. He's great. Um, I like a lot of CEOs. That's kind of like what I get my inspiration from because these guys are the ones that are making the, the decisions. So if these guys do everything right, then uh, we can come in and just share their, their genius, really. That's all we're doing. So um, I do look up to a lot of CEOs. Okay. So what's the one book that you would recommend to someone who's willing to understand or put their money in asset fund management or in a private hedge fund such as yours uh well i think the market wizards books are pretty good um, the, uh, jack schweggers yeah okay. i mean if you want to if you want to know like the psychology of it and and how people um interpret their trading styles i think that's a good way to go if you want to, I mean, you get a little bit of everything in those books. So I think, yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to go. Okay. So what does the future look like for you now that you've been doing this for 10 years? Are you planning to do it for the next 50 years until you retire? Um, I'm honestly thinking about doing something else, but um, I might, I mean, I will always manage my own money. Because I don't think I would ever stop investing, but managing other people's money, um, I think that's going to come to an end sometime. Not because of anything bad. It's just it's a lot of stress, and uh, I think that if people are interested in that business, you have to take that into account. I mean, it's very stressful. You're managing you're managing money and people, and a lot of people don't tell you that, but you you are, and you're managing their expectations. You're managing them calling you. Uh, my clients happen to be very good and they trust me and they don't really help me but I know other guys that get calls 24-7 I mean sometimes, sometimes they get called at 3 in the morning you know and they have to pick up they don't really have a choice so um, some people just are not meant to invest in hedge funds and, and they make it difficult for us but others, yeah, other people know the risk. And if you, I think if you're a person that's honest and you always say what you have to say and you don't try to sound too like you know, condescending or anything like that, people are going to be cool with, with giving you their money. But you have to take into account that 
uh, it's a big responsibility. And I like to look at it as like I'm managing someone's retirement or someone's uh, gift to their son in graduation or whatever, the, whatever they're going to use the money that we're going to make, I'm managing that and that's in my hands. And if 10 years pass and this person wants to cash out and I have very little to show for it, I'm going to feel crappy. You know, like it's not even about whether they knew the risk or not. It's just how about how I'm going to feel inside. Maybe I'm too tough on myself, but I don't think that that's, I mean, I'm not the type of person that can just walk away and say, oh, well, I lost it. Who cares? Move on. I, yeah. I can't do that. I just can't do that. I'm not wired that way. So I, I, I think I want to move on to something else. I've always wanted to start some kind of business other, you know, outside of managing money. So maybe I'll look into that. Okay. I think it gets easier if you make your clients, your friends, that way you don't see them as your customers. You view them as your friends and you do the, what's best for your friends. So thanks that for your... It a, that makes it a double-edged sword, though. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to disappoint your friends, right? Exactly, which is why you will have their best interest at heart. And managing their money, yeah. So thanks for your time. Um, we'd love to have you in future after you take on your new venture, hopefully in trading. Um, we look forward to having you once more. Thank you. Oh, thank you for me. And uh, 